Deuteronomy 31, we're getting ready to finish out the book Devarim. We only have a couple more parshot to go, and then we're starting another cycle. Wow. And like we said, you know, before we got into all this, it, we're not just finishing out the Torah and say, okay, that's it. We've gone through the Torah. Well, we don't have to go back through it again. You know, it's, it's no, now that we go through, we take our understanding of what we have and let's continue to learn, continue to build, continue to uh, have the Father reveal to us what he desires, right? So here, don't forget, Devarim, you know, Moshe is addressing all Israel. Now, at different points through Devarim, he's speaking to different people. But he's really talking to all Israel a lot. Okay? I mean, we start off with uh, Ele Hadvarim. These are the words of Moshe, which I find interesting because when Yah called Moshe to the burning bush, he says, I'm not a man of words. I'm not a man of Devarim. And then we start this book, Devarim. These are the words of Moses. And so there's a, a, a learning, there's a growth. There's a progression. Moshe has changed, okay? But so have the people. And, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be changing into what the Father is desiring for us to be so that we can go in and inhabit, inherit, and dwell in the promises he has for us. And so when we're going through the Torah, we're learning these are for us. These are promises and, and things that show us ways of life, paths of blessing, the Father's heart being revealed to a people whom he's called out and redeemed and called his own. So what are these things that Moshe is getting ready to tell the people? Well, first thing off, Devarim 30, 31. Moshe went and spoke these words unto all Israel, and he said to them, I'm 120 years old today. Wow. 120 years old today. You know, we think 120 years, we think, Man, that's a, that's a nice, full life, right? But was 120 years a lot to Noah? <laughs> you know? So, so think about this for a minute. If he's thinking about these 120 years that he has spent in this life, and that's short, what is the span of eternity? And so we're being mindful of the kingdom and not just the things that are here, but eternity to come. And so when Moshe is addressing the people of Israel, and he says, I'm 120 years old today, he says, I can no longer go out and come in. Why? It's not because he didn't have the strength. It's not because he couldn't see. The scripture says that when he died, his eyes were not dim, nor his strength abated. I mean, he was, I, 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 I put it to you this way. Moses at 120 could take any 40-year-old I know today. All right? So, what does this really mean? And we'll come back and we'll address that in a minute. He says, I can no longer go out and come in. As the Lord has said to me, you will not go over into this, this land. And that's really the reason why he can't go out and come in. Moshe has led them up to the point of entering into the promise. He has shown them the way to the promise. He has told them how to fulfill life in walking in the promise. But he cannot actually step into it. All Israel has to step into that. Okay? Now, Moshe in 120 years, you know, we like to, to split up the span of his life over 40 years. Because it's convenient for us like that. Well, the first 40 years, you know, he was in Egypt. And then at, at 40, he tried to deliver the, he the Hebrew who was being beaten by an Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian. And when it was found out, he fled. And so he was in the wilderness for another 40 years, learning how to tend somebody else's sheep. There's something to that. Then he had to go back and be that person, to be that voice for Yah in the midst of Israel and lead them out into the wilderness so that they could prepare themselves to enter into the promise. There's a lot here. Okay? So let's see, let's see where we're, where we're going to go with this today. First off, when Moshe says, I'm 120 today, keep, it, keep this in mind. At what point did Moses retire? Yeah, he didn't. <laughs> up to the day he died, he was serving. Up until, up until the day that he passed, he was ministering to Israel. And, and it really is an amazing testimony of, of this man that, the, that, that Yah had in the midst of Israel. Because he says he gave his address to Israel, he climbed the mountain, 
And then that was it. Could he have climbed the mountain if he was too feeble and too old to be able to lead the mountain, come in? No, I mean, he, was, he climbed the mountain. So what this is about is we will serve the kingdom, we will serve the Father, and we will honor Him until our last breath. Okay, there, there is no retirement plan in the kingdom of Yah. We are all important in the kingdom. Now, keep in mind, Moshe, in the midst of this time, when we think of our life, we think of like uh, um, Yaakov, when, when Pharaoh says, so how old are you? And he goes, oh, long and hard have been the days of my life, you know, kind of a thing, right? Moshe had the opportunity in this address to all Israel, you know, to stand up there. I'm 120 years old today. I'm about to leave you all, and I've had it with you people. <laughs> this is not what he did. Moses had plenty of opportunities to be discouraged. Moses had plenty of opportunities to quit. But he didn't. Matter of fact, he get, get to certain points where he actually laid his life down and in interceding for Israel. Saying, saying, well, if you're not leading them in, then don't bother taking me in either. Hmm. See, Moses was an example of not just a leader in Israel, but a true servant. He's an example of how we can all work with one another. And when you're working and serving in things, let's face it, not everyone knows your thoughts, your hearts, your intent, or anything else. And so when you're in any kind of position, when you're in front of anyone else, let's face the facts. There's misunderstandings. There's miscommunications. And a lot of times there's, there's uh, that, well, like I have up here, he had opportunities to make excuses or to quit, like he struck the rock in his anger and his frustration. He struck the rock. He had to go through false accusations. He had to go through corrupt leaders, Korah. He had to go through corrupt leaders, corrupt leadership. He had to go through constant complaining, constant backbiting, all of these things he had to go through. And when God says, Moses, I'm just going to get rid of all of them and start over with you, Moses could have said, you know, you got, you're on to something there, God. Because even when, even when Moses was called, you know, he, he, he cried out to God saying, am, am I the father of this people? Did I say, you know? But yet we find in the, same, in the same time, Moshe laying his life down for these same people that are constantly arguing with him, constantly doing the backbite, and constantly making the accusations, constantly doing all these things. Hello? Life of a shepherd. Because Moses was a great shepherd. Now, the, the, the great shepherd is Yeshua, right? But Moses was a great shepherd. But it took him 40 years to tend Yethro's flock to, to figure it out. All right? So, I have up here, don't give up. You must fulfill your role or your purpose within the kingdom. Like Galatians says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if what? We do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to whom? everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So let us do good to all, but especially to those of the household of faith. This is humility, this is servitude, and this is the heart of the Father. Right? All right, so back to Deuteronomy 31, 1 and 2. So he says, I can no longer go out or come in because the Lord says you cannot cross over this yard in. What did this have to do with anything? This had to do with uh, uh, Moshe saying, I can't do it as much as it was, as it was time to transfer leadership. It was time for Israel to go and enter in. Therefore, Moshe knew he had to leave. Could you imagine if Moshe says, okay, guys, I can't lead you anymore. Joshua's going to lead you. And then he tagged along. Every move Joshua would make, there'd be people would be going, "Hey Moses." Yeah, right? Every everything that everything Joshua said, someone would go to Moses saying, "What do you think about this?" This is what Joshua said, but what do you think? See, so Moshe knew 
He had to leave to transfer ownership, leadership of all Israel to Yahushua so that he could lead them in, so that he could go before them, so that he could help make a way before them. But before he left, there was to be one last battle here. That was with the Amalekites. So think about this. Even before he went up the mountain, he was still involved in a battle. What a testimony. At 120. Wow. Numbers 27, 15 through 18. What was, Ye- what was Moshe asking for in the leader that would, sus- that would come after him? Numbers 27, 15 to 18. Moshe said to Adonai, Let Adonai, the God of the spirits of all human beings, appoint a man to be over the community to do what? To go out and to come in ahead of them. To lead them out and bring them in. So the Adonai's community will not be like what? Sheep without a shepherd. And Adonai said to Moshe, Take Yehoshua, the son of Nun, a spiritual man, or a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him. So what he's saying is that the one who was to lead Israel was not necessarily the best general. Not necessarily the one who was the best politician. Not necessarily the one who, who was the, the people filled that was the best man for the job. Israel was not a democracy. But yet, Yah told Moshe to call out Yehoshua and bring him forward, lay his hands on him, and he will impart some of, some of his, his spirit to him. Because in Yehoshua is the spirit of Yah. He is a man with the heart of Yah. He is a man to lead Israel out, to lead them in. To, when they're going out to war, when they're going out to battle, to lead them out without leading them astray. And to bring them back home when they need to come back. This was important for Israel. Solomon prayed for the same thing, you know. That when he was to go before the, the people, when he was to be their king, that he wanted to lead them out and lead them in. It's not about who, who just rules, who rules well. It's not about well, who, who seems more authoritative. There was a purpose to this. Why was Solomon given the position beyond, okay, well, he was David's son. Yeah, but David had other sons. Right? Solomon prayed. 2 Chronicles 1.10, Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this your, this your people? That is so great. Solomon asked for, if we go back and we look at, at, at when God says, say what you want and I'll give it to you, and we find Solomon asked for wisdom, what he really asked for was a heart to Shema. A heart to hear. See? And that's to, that's to discern what the people needed so that he could lead them out righteously and to lead them in the ways of Yah. And this was supposed to be the leader in Israel. Matthew 9, 36-38, speaking of Yeshua. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as what? Sheep having no shepherd. They were fainted. They, they're physically and mentally and spiritually, they were exhausted. They were weak. They were beaten up. And they were scattered all over because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So what did Yeshua do? He said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plenteous, but the labors are few. So pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into the harvest. When he says the laborers are few, when it says few, it doesn't just mean a small number. It means not equipped. They don't have the tools they need to do the job. They don't have the right, the right stuff to get them out there. So pray that those who are going into the harvest have what they need to go into the harvest. And what's the first thing? First and foremost, what do they need? It's the heart. It's the heart. To lead the people, to go out, to come in, to be a servant to them. To serve in the kingdom. When we come into the kingdom, are we vying for a position or are we trying to help each other? Are we trying to serve? Are we trying to help build up the community? Or are we just trying to get something for ourselves? It's different with the kingdom of Yah. It doesn't follow suit as the ways of the world, does it? So the time is approaching for Moshe to pass the torch. And now he raises up a successor to continue leading them. Which 
think about this. Wisdom is passes on from generation to generation if the next generation will receive it. Again, go back to the heart, isn't it? When we pass on wisdom from one generation to the next, unfortunately, a lot of the gen- next following generation doesn't have the heart to listen to what has come before, which means they kind of take a step backward before they can take two forward. So instead of taking two steps forward, they're really only taking one. And so what we, what we need to do is to try to help build this together. This is why it's so important throughout the Torah to say, teach it to your children. Teach it to your children. Why? So that they will know. So that they will hear. So that they will understand. So that they will have the heart for it. The older generation is supposed to teach the younger generation. And the younger generation is supposed to listen when they're being taught. (laughs) There's discipline involved in both areas. Leviticus 19.32 says, Stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. You shall fear your God. I am Yahweh. Notice this. He doesn't say to stand up and honor those that are older because you respect them because of who they are. We should, but that's not what it says. It says you stand up and honor them because I am your God. So the reverence that we give to those who are older is not because we like them. It's because if he is our God, we give the respect. Therefore, if we do not teach our children to have respect, it's not just not showing respect to to those that are older than them. It's not showing respect to Yahweh because we're not teaching our children to respect those that are older than them. Tough, isn't it? Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days so that we what? That we get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days so that we will get a heart of wisdom. What if someone said something like uh, the problem with... with, uh, What was that? The problem with uh, with, with the strength and all this is that it's wasted on youth? (laughs) If we, if we had, if we were physically capable and, and the, it had the older in years, man, we could do wonders. But here we are. We need to number our days. And the problem with youth is you think you're going to last forever. And you're not. And there's a point, some point in your life when you come to realize, I'm not immortal. And hopefully it's not too late. <laughs> Where we could still make an impact. And, and, and make a good positive thing in, in the community and in the lives of those around us. So teach us to number our days. Why? Because if we number our days, it doesn't mean we know when we're, when we're going to die, but w- if we number our days, we're talking about we'll try to make each day count. We'll try to find the wisdom for today in today. We'll try to show the heart of the Father somehow today. We'll try to walk in His kingdom somehow today. There's wisdom in that. Because we're not seeking our own heart, we're seeking Yahweh's. 1 Peter 5, 1-6 So I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of the Messiah as well as partaker in the glory that that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Notice it didn't say shepherd someone else's flock. Just saying. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Notice this, when it says humble yourselves, he's saying the, that, the, that the elders be mindful of what they're doing and do it honorably, and that those who are younger, listen to them. And they're, but they're both told to humble themselves. So they'll say, well, I've been around longer than you, so you've got to listen to me. No. At the same time, you go, you're getting old, old man, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> We, we all need to be humble, okay? Deuteronomy 31.7. So then Moshe summoned Yehoshua, and he said to him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous. 
For you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to the fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is Yahweh who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. What an awesome scripture. Can you imagine? Yehoshua, as he's standing here before all Israel and Yahweh, you can imagine he probably was fearful. He had been right there with Moshe. He knew what he'd been through. He knew what he was in store of. So he probably was scared. And so here he stands, and Moshe is telling them, be strong and courageous. It is the Lord your God who does go before you. And he says something like this. He says, be strong and courageous because you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn. I, I, I like to point this out. It can be read a couple different ways. It can be read like, be strong and courageous for you shall lead these people into this land. Or, be strong and courageous because you shall lead these people into this land. <laughs> Either way, the point is the same. That Yehoshua was to stand firm and not just, not to be abusive, but to stand strong in the Word. Not to waver from the Word that he was to show Israel. Okay? So this is what he was to be strong and courageous in, in keeping and following the words of the Father as he led the people in. So be strong is the word hazak. Like, like when we finish a, 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 a book, you know, Hazak, Hazak, beneath Hazak. Be strong, be strong, may we be strengthened, right? Hazak means to be strong or to be courageous or to encourage. Okay, so when we say be strong, it says to encourage yourself. Strengthen yourself. I'm thinking David at Ziglag, right? He encouraged himself, not in his ability, but in the ability of his God. And that's what, we're so, that's what we're supposed to do. To encourage ourselves, not in our ability, but in the words of the living God that we walk in. He is our God, therefore He goes before us. And if we're following Him, who can we fear? If we're, if we're dwelling in fear all the time, maybe we're not on the right road. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the, spe- because the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved and every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David did what? Encouraged himself in Yahweh his God. 2 Chronicles 31.4 Hezekiah commanded that the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might what? Be encouraged in the Torah of Yahweh. Hezekiah was saying to honor the Levites and the priests in their midst, that way they will be encouraged in the Torah. How can they be encouraged in the Torah of Yahweh? By, by, by honoring the Levites and the priests? Because how are they supposed to learn it? Who is supposed to teach them? Right? Okay. Uh, 2 Chronicles 35, 2. And he set priests in their charges and encouraged them to the service of the house of Yahweh. So those who were set in for service were encouraged to that service. They were strengthened in that service to stand in and given the ability to walk in what what was ahead of them. Keep in mind, guys, uh, Yahweh doesn't always call the most talented to something. He will equip the one whom he calls. So Yehoshua 1, 6 through 9. Check it out. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people you shall divide for an inheritance the land which I swear to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. What is he supposed to be very courageous in doing? Verse 7, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Turn not from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 8, the book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then you shall make your way prosperous, and you shall have good success. Have I not commanded you? It's like one more time. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. How many times just in this short span is he saying, be strong and courageous? Why? Because it's easy to collapse under the, under the stress, under the strain. It's easy to look around and to get discouraged. 
So he's telling them, be strong and be courageous. Be mindful of the words that you were given. Be mindful of who your God is. Be mindful of the one that you serve. And wherever I lead you, I am there with you. And that is something that we should take with us. So how was the leader fashioned? Well, Moshe spent 40 years in the wilderness. Notice Moses being in in Egypt, he was he was trained in, in the Egyptian schools. He was trained in the, I mean he was there. So why didn't he learn there how to be a leader? No, what he learned there needed to get worked out of him. He had to spend 40 years in the wilderness to learn to to unlearn what he was taught in Egypt. And to learn to serve. To learn to care for the sheep who, didn't, who couldn't care for themselves. Who couldn't tend for themselves. He had to learn to care for them. And to lay his life down for them. And defend them. And when the, when the, when the wolves and all, the, all these other ant- bears, when the lions, when they all, he had to fight them off. Hmm. Like I said before, he had to learn to tend somebody else's flock. Not even his own. What gain did he get out of it? Not much, really. I mean, as long as he was with Yitro, he could take of what was in Yitro's house, but what did he have of his own? Hmm. Matthew 28, or before I go there, Yehoshua spent 40 years in the wilderness as well, learning how to be a shepherd. Well, how did he do that? By being there with Moshe. By learning through Moshe. By being discipled by Moshe. He had to learn how to be a shepherd he knew how to be a worker in Egypt. He didn't know how to be a shepherd. And so he had to learn from Moshe. That's discipleship, guys. He had to learn how to do that. And he's had, he had his 40 years in the wilderness as well. Matthew 23, 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. John 13, 16, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Luke 6, 39 and 40, He spoke a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into the pit? So it's not just a matter of you need, we need people to disciple, we need to be discipled, we need to be a disciple, but we also have to be careful of those we're submitting ourselves to. And the problem with that is we, we rake everyone over the coals with a fine-tooth comb and we use double standards all over the place and we will not submit ourselves to anybody who we think we're better than. Wow. That's a problem. Because uh, nobody's perfect. Look at the mistakes Moses made. So that's not the point then. The point is, are we willing to work together in the places and the positions that the Father has put us in to benefit the whole community, not just you? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Not, ex- not exactly the, the same saying, that, but will be like-minded, like, likewise. So Yehoshua stood guard over Moshe. He served him, but he was also spending time in the, t- in the tent. That's what I'm talking about. Korah wanted to be a leader in the assembly. Yahashua just wanted to serve. We don't find anywhere where Joshua said, ooh, Moses, I want to do what you're doing. I didn't see it anywhere. Hey, I could be wrong. I didn't see it anywhere. I'm not saying it's not there. I didn't see it anywhere. What we do find, however, is Yahashua being a servant. And that, Yah used. Do we have the heart to be a servant? And allow the Father to raise us up in what He desires for us. Or do we say, well, I don't like serving that way. Do we serve where the need is, is needed? <laughs> or do we serve where we want to serve? Exodus thirty-three, eleven. So Yahweh spoke to Moshe face to face as a man speaks to his friend and he turned again to the camp. But his servant, Yehoshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. It doesn't say a servant of Yah, it says Moses' servant. How many of us would be willing to be called that of somebody else? Truthfully. But what does Yeshua say? The greatest among you will be the servant of all. 
And, and it's not our job to make sure others are serving. You catch me? Numbers eleven twenty eight and 29. Yehoshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moshe, one of his young men, answered and says, my Lord Moshe, forbid them. Moshe says, are, are you envy, envious for my sake? Again, servant of Moshe. Well, we shouldn't serve a man. We should serve God. I agree. But the problem here with that statement is that when the people were, were honoring Moshe in their midst, they were honoring Yah. Because when they were coming against Moshe, they were coming against Yah. And not saying Moses was perfect, and not saying anybody is. But we do need to be careful that we are working together where the Father has put us for the better of the kingdom. There's places there. Okay? Deuteronomy 31 9. So then Moshe wrote this law and gave it to whom? Yes, all Israel, but who did he actually literally hand the book to? The priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, and to all the elders of Israel. So he did not give the book to the masses. He gave the book, the scroll, right? He gave the book to Levi, the priests, and the elders. Why? Because they were the ones who were trained in how to handle it. They were the ones who were trained to keep the holy things holy and trained in what was being said there. Because here's the, here's the problem. When we read something, especially if we just read it out of context, we can, we can really say anything we want. And we can make the Scripture say anything we want if we start pulling Scriptures out of context. There's a Scripture that says, everything you see will be yours if you just worship me. Yeah, you know who said that? Hasatan said it. To Yeshua... But Hasatan said it. You really want to quote that? This is my point. You can, you can make up stuff and, and find something to back it up if you want to pull stuff out of context. So there had to be those who were trained and taught how to handle the word properly and how to, how to say, no, it doesn't say that, it says this. You know, and, and, and these are ones, when Moshe pulled the elders, he was supposed to teach them Torah. So that they would know. So that they could teach everyone else. So the word was entrusted to those who were trained how to handle it. Like Ezekiel 44, 23. And they, speaking of the Levites, the sons of Zadok, shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. This was such a big deal, guys, that Yahweh talked to Aaron specifically and directly regarding this. How many times do you find in the scripture where it says, and Yahweh says to Aaron? I mean, we find, and Yahweh said to Moshe, a lot. But how many times do you say, and Yahweh said to Aaron? It's not there very much. Right? So what did he tell them? Yahweh spoke to Aaron saying, Do not drink the wine or strong drink, nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And you may put a difference between the holy and the unholy, between the unclean and the clean. And you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Hmm. This is specifically something they were supposed to be trained in and to teach all Israel. Why? Because it was important. Why? So that people don't die in their uncleanness. Why? Because the Father wants us to have life. He wants us to live the life that He desires for us. Okay, so back to Deuteronomy 33, chapter 33, the blessing that was to Levi, speaking of, you know, Levi, the ones who were trained to handle the word. Of Levi, he said, Your tomb and Urim will be your pious one, whom you tested at Massah, whom you struggled at Meribah's spring, of his father and mother. He said, I don't know them. He didn't acknowledge his brothers or children, for he observed your word and kept your covenant. He will, they, will, they will teach, verse 10, they will teach Yaakov your rulings, Israel, your Torah, they will set incense before you and hold burnt offerings on your altar. Adonai, bless his possessions, accept the work he does, but crush his enemies hip and thigh. May those who hate him rise no more. Hmm. You know, so things like this makes me think of, of, of people who come against those in Israel, currently in Israel, 
those who come against the Levites, those who come against all these things. What, is, what, is, what was the blessing that Moshe had given to Levi? May those who come against him rise no more. Hmm. We need to think about these kind of things, right? Deuteronomy 31, verse 10. So Moshe commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity, that's the moed, so in the moed of the Shemitah, in, in Hag Sukkot, when all Israel is to come up here before Yahweh your God in the place you shall choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. So every seventh year, the entire Torah was read to all Israel in the Feast of Sukkot. Think about this. When all Israel is gathered together, not just the men, not just the priests, all Israel is gathered together, they are to hear the entire Torah read in their midst every seventh year. Wow. See, we think an hour service is too long. Try eight days reading the Torah. Think about it, guys. We need to stop with the excuses. What it really comes down to, where is our heart? Because if we see something as important, you better believe we're going to make it happen. If we don't think it's important, one thing becomes an, becomes an excuse to call the whole thing off. But if we really want something, we won't let anything stand in our way. No, there's no trial, there's no tribulation, there's no mountain, there's no valley. We're doing it. But if we don't want to do it, well, I'm a little tired today. Huh. Where is our priority? Where is our heart? Tough, isn't it? When are they supposed to gather in to do this? At the Feast of Ingathering. When is the Feast of Ingathering? Sukkot, Exodus 23, 15. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I command you in the time appointed, the month of Aviv. For in it you came out of Egypt, none shall appear before me empty-handed. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors when you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year when you have gathered in all the labors of the field. There we go. So, when we're gathering in and being in gathered, and when we're gathering all together, we're told we're supposed to gather all together. And when we gather all together, our focus and our emphasis should be on the word of Yah, his heart. Right? He says, you shall read all this law before Israel in their hearing. They are to hear the entire of the word. Why? Well, 31.12. Gather, that word gather is kahal, which means convoke. That means to assemble. That means a gathering. Gather the people together, who? All of them. The men, the women, the children, and the stranger in their gates. That they may what? Hear. That they may learn. That they may fear Yahweh your God. And observe to do all the words of this Torah. How can they do if they don't know? How can they do what the Torah says if they don't know what it says? So we need to remove that excuse. They need to know what the word of the, of the Father is. They need to know what his heart is, what his desire is. And in order to do that, we must gather to hear the word taught. The problem is we can't get people to gather. 2 Timothy 3.16 all Scripture is written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of Yahweh may be perfected and complete in every good work. We need to hear the Word to walk in the Word. Right? When it says all Scripture, well, what Scripture was written at this time? It was the Tanakh. So, all Scripture? Yeah, all of it. Right? So the gathering at the year of release was to do what? To hear all the words of the Torah. Are we willing to hear all the words of the Torah? We should be. Because that is the Father's heart to us. That is His desires for us. What if we refuse to gather? Well, of Sukkot, it says those who refuse to gather, there will be no rain. 
Well, if there's no rain, you know, what does that mean? Drought. Severe drought means what? Death. So he says, the gathering is blessing. What if we refuse to gather? Well, how about this? What you seek to save? Your own ideas, your own thoughts, your own life. What does Scripture say about that? That which you seek to save, you'll lose. Anything you put in front of or before the Father is an idol. And he doesn't like idols. Luke eleven twenty three, 23. He, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not with me, what? Scatters. If we're not gathering, we're scattering. It's not either or. Okay? We need to learn to be a people to gather together. Right? And I, and I know some people live like great distances and there really isn't any place around them that they can gather. I get that. But are you looking? Is it your desire to do so? Are you, are you trying to find a way? Luke 17, 33. Whoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Where is he getting advice from? Other people. <laughs> we have to be around each other, right? Advice from elders. Advice from the wisdom, those who have it to impart. Proverbs 18, 1 and 2. He who separates himself indulges his desires and shows contempt for sound advice of any kind. A fool takes no pleasure in trying to understand. He only wants to express his own opinion. Don't look at me. That's in Proverbs. <laughs> is our desire to do this or is our desire to isolate ourselves, to separate ourselves? Because I'm only interested in hearing what I got to say, not what anyone else has to say. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto what? Yeah, love and good works. We're supposed to provoke each other to love and to good works. See, I've got to make sure I finish that quickly. Right? In verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Our strength, yes, is in our God. But our support comes in our gathering. It comes from being around one another. It comes from, from helping each other out. It comes from, from having that, that face-to-face -face connection with those that are like-minded. And it helps tremendously, doesn't it? Nehemiah 8.18 so also by day from the first day to the last day of Sukkot, Ezra read from the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to the manner. Again, just to say, when they were gathering together, they were, they were seeking the heart of the Father. When, when we gathered, we hear what? The Torah. Deuteronomy 31, 13. And that their children which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land where you go to possess it. So we hear not just for us, but for our children as well. And we can't say, kid, you need to listen so you can hear this. No, we need it too. Because if we think we've got it all figured out, we're no longer a disciple. A disciple is a student. If you're not learning, you're not a student. So at what point do we cease being a disciple? Never. So when the word is, is there and when the word is read, we need to listen as well. And here's the thing, children follow examples better than words. So if the word is important to you, your children will see that. Deuteronomy 4.10, Gather me the people together and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. Important that the words of Yah are being passed to the next generation. Because if the word of Yah is not being passed on, then the next generation will not know what righteousness is. And if they don't know what righteousness is, they cannot teach it to their children. And then, when, and then everything becomes iniquities. Right? Deuteronomy 31, 14. 
Yahweh said to Moshe, Behold, your days approach that you must die. Call Yehoshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a charge. And Moshe and Yehoshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And Yahweh appeared in the tabernacle in the pillar of a cloud. In the pillar of a cloud, he stood over the door of the tabernacle. So, Yehoshua is being charged with the task of leading Israel into the promise. Okay? But in the task of leading Israel into the promise, there's a couple things he has to keep in mind. Okay? It's not like, okay, you're the leader for Israel, now just go do whatever you want. Don't forget everything you've been trained in, just start over. He was trained in the Torah. He was trained to know the heart of Yahweh. So when they went in to lead the people, that's what he was to continue in. Okay? Because if they enter into the promise and they forsake the word, they're not going to stay in the land. And they were a nation because of covenant. They were not a nation because they were just in Egypt together. They were not a nation just because they were in the same land together. They were a nation because of covenant. So if they forsake the covenant, they will be removed from the land. See, it is the covenant that binds the people together, and it is the covenant that places the people with the land. It's all together. If they forsake covenant then they could be scattered and then they can be cast out of the land. Verse 16. And the Lord said to Moshe, Behold, you shall sleep with your fathers and this people will rise up and go whoring after gods of strangers of the land where they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. My anger shall be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them and I will hide my face from them and they shall be devoured and many evils and troubles shall befall them so that they will say in the day, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us. In other words, a day of realization, right? All, all these things are happening to us because God is not with us. And then, then comes to the, the big question, well, why not? <laughs> right? And then that, lead, that's, that should lead us back to a place of repentance, Right? Verse 18, and I will surely have my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, which they are turned unto other gods. All right, look at this. Psalm 106. Psalm chapter, or yeah, Psalm 106. Ver, uh, a couple different verses in there, but a couple things I want to point out. So we have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity and we have done wickedly. We, we were mingled among the heathen and we learned their works. And, and they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. And then they say, verse 47, Save us, O Lord our God. Gather us from among the heathen and give thanks to your holy name and to triumph in your praise. In Psalm 106, we find what Moshe was prophesying. You're going to go into the land. You're not going to do what I've asked you to do. You're going to be dispersed into all the world, but there you will repent, you will cry out, and I will regather you. And again, you know, I say this, that this is all over the Tanakh, but I'm showing you. It really is. Hoshea, 1, 1 through 7. Uh, go back and read the whole thing. I'm pulling, I'm pulling pieces out of this to kind of show you the thought, but read, read the, full, the full verse of it. So the word of Yahweh came to Hoshea, Go take unto you a wife of whoredoms, the children of whoredoms, for the land has committed great whoredom, departing from Yahweh. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dib uh, Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son, and Yahweh said to him, Call his name Jezreel, and it shall come to pass that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So this is, this is something that's being prophesied here. I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again, bare a daughter, and God said, Call her name Loruhumah, for I will uh, no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. And, but I will have mercy in the house of Judah and save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow or by sword or by battle, by horses or by horsemen. So he's saying that he will scatter Israel. He's saying he will send them all over. He will keep, hold on to Yehuda, but he will scatter Israel. And, and what do we talk about this? That, he had, that she had a son and called him Jezreel? What about it? Israel means God will sow, S-O-W, sow, like plant, sow. So Yezreel means, because of idolatry, Israel was sowed into all the nations. And they're waiting for the time of the harvest when Israel is called back. Again, prophecy? Very much so. 
We're seeing this time of exile. We're seeing this time of disbursement. But we're seeing this time of being called back and reassembled as well. And when we're called back and when we reassemble and when we repent and come to Yahweh, we're told to remember something. What are we told to remember? Malachi 4, 1-6 through For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day shall come that will burn them up, says Yahweh Zavaot, and shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up like calves out of the stall. If you go forth like calves out of the stall, what does that mean? You ever see them like when they're there and they, the doors bust open? What do they do? Do they kind of... They ain't moseying, are they? But they're like, boom, they're out, right? All over there dancing and prancing and jumping around, all, right? So it's exciting, but we're told something. So you shall tread down the wicked, for there shall be ashes under the soles of your feet, and that day I shall do this, says Yahweh. Oh, verse 4. When all this happens to you, what are we told? Remember the law, the Torah of Moses, my servant, which I commanded to him in horror for all Israel with the statutes of judgments. Then he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah. Because he says, when you are redeemed, when you're brought out, when you're set forth, and when, you, when all this is happening, and you, go, and you go forth, and you're joyful, don't forget the Torah. Why? Because we will. It's important that we, that we are mindful of the heart of the Father. And he says, I will send you Eliyahu. Why? To bring restoration. The heart of the Father to the people, and the heart of the people to the Father. Notice all that goes back to remember the Torah. Because that is the heart of the Father. To walk with Him and to walk in His ways. Right? Deuteronomy 31, 23. And Yahweh commissioned Yehoshua, the the son of Nun, and He said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the people of Israel to the land I swore to give them. I will be with you. When Moshe had finished writing the words of this law in a book to the very end, Moshe commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The Levites who what? carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take this book of the law, put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Keep in mind, guys, when they go into the land, they are not going into the land without the Ark of the Covenant. Because they're not going into the land without covenant. And they're not going into the land without the Torah going before them. Where was the book? With the Ark. Where was the Ark? In front of them. So when they were walking into the land, they were literally following the presence of Yah and the word of Yah. So when they go into the land, they're following the ark, they're following the testimony, they're following the covenant, they're following the Torah, they're following all of this in order to go into the land. If they're not following that, they're not going into the land. So what does it say with us when we're walking in the promise? When we're walking in His promise, we need to make sure that it is His Word that goes before us. That we need to make sure that it is His Spirit that goes before us. If not, we're following the wrong thing. John 14, 23. Yeshua says, If anyone loves Me, he will keep My Word. And My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love Me does not keep My words. Well, That's because Yeshua spoke something different than the Father, right? Should we read the rest of the verse? It says, And the word you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So if we're walking with Yeshua, we're walking in the word of the Father. Hmm. We are to walk in His ways, walk in His paths, walk in His truth, and honor Him in all that we do. Amen? Thank you.